If a party loses in federal court, can they bring the exact same claim in state court or are they barred from doing so? To find out, you have to read Russell versus New York University, but it's 47 pages. Don't have time for that. I've got you covered. This is TLDR, Too Long Didn't Read, where I cover New York Court of Appeals cases, and I try to do it in five minutes or less. This is the episode on the case of Russell versus New York University. The citation for this case is 2024 New York Slip Opinion 02226, published by the New York Court of Appeals on April 25th of 2024. The issue in this case is to what extent prior lawsuits that are filed in federal court can affect a lawsuit that's filed in state court later on. Uh, to understand and appreciate the context of this case, the background that's helpful to know is, is the concept of collateral estoppel. Collateral estoppel is a concept that, that means that it bars relitigation of things that are already decided by a prior court. So it, it, what it technically is, is bars the relitigation of an issue of fact or law that's actually been litigated and resolved in a valid court determination essential to the prior judgment. And those determinations, those factual or legal determinations are binding in future cases that relate to the same exact issues. Um, so if there's an identity, if there's the same issue being litigated in the prior case and the current case, and the parties are the same, and the parties had a full and fair opportunity to litigate those issues, then the party is collaterally stopped. They're, they're precluded from trying to change or, or modify that prior factual finding. They're stuck with the, with the prior result. Uh, so what are the facts in this case? The facts are that plaintiff was an adjunct professor at, at New York University. She was an adjunct professor of liberal arts. And for months, she received unsolicited offensive mail to her NYU mailbox and to her email that targeted her based on her age, her race, her ethnicity, her uh, gender identity, or sexual orientation. She also was a victim of online impersonation. People would post things on websites using her name as the as the as the poster, even though it wasn't her. She reported this conduct to the administration officials and employment uh, employment officers at NYU, and they started an investigation. Uh, measures were taken to limit the harmful impact, but plaintiff was not happy with how NYU was handling it, so she filed she filed the lawsuit against them in federal court, Southern District of New York, and she claimed. That the N- that NYU, the administrators and individuals uh, were responsible for the conduct, created a hostile work environment, uh, engaged in discrimination, retaliation, um, and human rights law violations. So as part of their case, um, the court sent the parties to mediation, uh, which was unsuccessful. They entered into a discovery, right? That's part of any case you enter discovery. Uh, and part of that is you enter, she entered into standard confidentiality agreements. So while we engage in this litigation, we're not going to talk about what goes on in the litigation. After she gets some of the, some of the discovery, the plaintiff then goes a little bit rogue, allegedly, and she contacts one of the witnesses that the defense intends to call, that anyone intends to call, uh, identified by the defendants as a potential witness, and starts sending that person a series of hostile and threatening emails. The defendants, NYU, sends plaintiff a cease and desist letter saying, stop doing that. You're breaching our confidentiality agreement. You're doing the wrong thing here. But the plaintiff continued even after receiving the cease and desist letter to do that. Several days later, plaintiff received a letter from NYU saying she was being fired because she engaged in harassing, intimidating, and threatening faculty, uh, faculty member and was a violation of the court directive. Plaintiff's union filed a grievance, ultimately went to uh, an arbitrator who awarded her back pay, but said this was, oh, you shouldn't be firing her. It's, that's too much. But she did engage in serious misconduct. Um, ultimately, at the close of discovery, NYU filed a motion for summary judgment, and the district court, the Southern District of New York, granted the summary judgment, basically saying, we don't need a trial. Based upon all the discovery, all the, all the evidence adduced during the discovery, there's no reasonable view of the evidence that would allow the plaintiff to win here. The court rejected, under factual reasons, the court rejected the hostile work environment claim, the discrimination and retaliation claim, the... Uh, and they declined to exercise jurisdiction over the city and state human rights law claims. The appeal to the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, they affirm, now the plaintiff decides to file in state court. So the plaintiff now files the same kind of allegations in state court, Bronx County, alleging violation of city and state human rights laws, intentional infliction of emotional distress, adding an individual as a, as a defendant. And at this point, the defendants moved to dismiss, saying collateral estoppel. We've been here before. We did this already. And the Supreme Court grants the motion to dismiss the Supreme Court says, this is the, the, the trial court in Bronx, 
says the federal court made factual findings here. They found that there was no basis to that it made no basis for finding that there was unlawful discrimination, which was the basis of an adverse employment action. There was no factual finding that the individuals were supervisory were in supervisory roles with respect to the to, to the plaintiff. So they throw the case out. It appeals to the appellate division, and they affirm, and it goes to the court of appeals. And here, the court of appeals agrees. The court of appeals says that when federal court has made an explicit finding that plaintiff produced no evidence on a relevant specific factual issue in the litigation, the application of collateral estoppel bars an identical claim in state cases. So that's what we have here. Basically, the the, the failure of the plaintiff to, to satisfy the obligation to produce evidence uh, or a factual basis in federal court dooms her state case uh, later on. With respect to the individual defendants, they agree that the, same, the, the, the court says the same thing, that there's the factual evidence is that the supervisor that the people were not supervisors and only supervisors can be held liable for human rights violations there is an importantly a uh, a dissent from judge rivera who says that that's wrong that that individual the 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 case with respect to the individuals is wrong because employees not just supervisors but employees should be allowed to be sued for human rights violations even if they're not supervisors because the language of the statute doesn't specifically require that they be supervisors. It's the case law. And she says, I would follow the language of the statute. But once again, the holding of the of the Court of Appeals is that collateral estoppel will bar a subsequent state action when a prior federal action about the same issues has, has been resolved against a party on factual legal grounds. Uh, and that's the case of Russell versus New York University. Have a good day. If you like what you just saw and want to see more just like it, please hit like or subscribe to let me know.